St Mary's City in Maryland is one of the earliest and best preserved colonial sites in America. When the English colonists landed here in 1634, they founded a city, the evidence of which is being unearthed by archaeologists today. Based on that evidence, a living history exhibition has been created aimed at bringing the past to life. Time Team are going to be working with the American archaeologists and amongst the reconstructed buildings to see what they can contribute to this story of America's earliest history. We've had a good explore, but this is not a holiday. As you know, it being Time Team, we've got just three days. What are we going to do? Well, we've got uh, three priorities, really. The, the chapel area, right. here, Henry, mm -hmm. in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, then St Peter's, down here. And then, if we get time, look at the look at the forts up at the top there. But that's that's, that's the what that's we'd really like. the centre of Why? our interest, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the chapel is. We know from the first days of settlement they were burying the colonists out there, and it might be one of the largest cemeteries we know yeah. of in the colonies. So and it you'd is. like to know from us maybe how big the cemetery was, which we might be able to find mm. out with geophysics. Right. Perhaps. Was there was there fences around it? Anything yeah, like that would help. How many have you got so far? Well, we know there's at least 100, 150 out yeah. there but there could be many times that. And what's this place, St. Peter's? Is this a church? No, it's not a church. Uh, St. Peter's was a brick manor house. It was one of the largest buildings we think of in the early settlement of Maryland and could be one of the most impressive homes in all of the colonies at this time. But of course, nothing survives above ground. Well, we've got now. the geophysics chaps in there now, so uh, you know, we hopefully we'll get something out yes. because it's because yeah. it's got the... And brick should on. show up extremely well yeah. on geophysics. Yeah. And what about these possible fort sites? Well, we know when they got off the Ark and the Dove, they built a fort. But how or where it was, exactly what it was like, is unknown. And there's two possible locations. One is a traditional yeah. spot, the other is based on some new analysis. So if we could come up with anything about where that is, because that's really the beginning of the whole colony, is that fort. So you reckon we can do you some good this weekend? I think this is a fascinating opportunity to learn some cool things about this Digits site. Overlap, right, right, come on, <laughs> a search for cool things. <laughs> The geophysics team have started work at the St. Peter's site first to give us more time to excavate any remains they find. The two techniques they're using here, magnetometry and resistivity, haven't been used before at St. Mary's City. Bill Trosbeck, who cut back the wheat for us, is intrigued by the idea of detecting buried walls. And so when you have a line of bricks in the ground and you walk over them with the instrument, you get a really strong signal at that point. You can actually pinpoint exactly where the foundation is then? Yes, yeah. Because we know the St Peter's mansion was destroyed by an explosion of gunpowder in 1694, the theory is that of the two techniques, it's the magnetometer which should give us the best results by detecting the magnetic change to the bricks caused by the heat of the explosion. We can actually see what's here without digging. Uh -huh. That's the theory. Yeah. That's the theory, but the fact is that we haven't got an American adapter for the computer, <laughs> so we can't get any readings at all until well, Chris has gone down the road to a hardware shop. That's right. I mean, basically, all our bat batteries are flat because we can't charge them up uh, at the moment. We've seen the results um, on the screen, but we can't piece them together. And uh, do you I, I know mean, if they're any good yet, or can oh, you yes. tell that? I, I, I mean, they look really good. Finally, having sorted out our computer problems, we can now show our huddle of expectant archaeologists the much-awaited geophysics pictures of the first European-styled house to have been built in America. Here we are, on cue, on cue. That is super. Wow. Summit out. Beautiful. What a nice square building. So with very clear magnetometry results in this field, we now know the exact location and orientation of the governor's mansion. And we also have the results of the resistivity survey, which seems to show the location of other walls. But what's this? Now I'm told this site's been dug before. But it showed very well, nice at one of the... Foreman? It... Foreman was an architectural historian who dug over, you can't really say excavated, dug over this site in 1940, but didn't leave accurate records uh, of what he did and what he found. So someone else has already dug this, so why are we that 
excited about it. I thought this was an earth-shattering find. <laughs> Nobody you now say well. 50 years ago who someone else Well, after Foreman did his tests, the location was lost. We haven't known where it was. We haven't known the orientation of the building. It's, it's amazing how blinkered someone like an architectural historian can be not to include <laughs> in his report a plan of where the thing was. Well, OK, we can't be sure how much Foreman did here. We need to dig. Tim, do you think that's two trenches? I think it would be at least two and possibly three. I would like to see two along this wall and one over here where this and these extensions. Is. Well, mm. I'd heard that you American archaeologists were incredibly conservative about, uh, about digging. I thought, well, if we can it's squeeze one trench on out of it. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to uncover the whole thing in three no, no, days. No. Yeah. I think we'll do very almost surgical yeah. units yeah. to yeah. see well, this, this... what's there. <laughs> well, in my excitement over three trenches, I've forgotten that the American way of working is different to our own. No machine digging here, and evaluation trenches are small. I didn't realise five by five was quite so small. Henry Foreman actually produced a plan of the building, but it's not clear how much was a result of excavation and how much was guesswork based on other buildings of this date in Europe. One model for St Peter's is Edile Hall in Staffordshire, England. Edile Hall is yeah. very interesting to us because it, it has, it's dates to the period that it could actually be an inspiration for St Peter's, or at least that's what we've been led to believe. Well, sadly, we've looked at the Victoria County history of Staffordshire and also the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments, and they date it fairly firmly to the early 18th century. So it's just that 20 or 30 years later uh, than St Peter's house. In a way that makes St Peter's all the more special because it, it precedes the only building we had as its model. Well hopefully our excavations this weekend will give us some solid evidence to help us build up a true picture of St Peter's mansion. But whatever it looked like, it certainly was very different to the Indian huts lived in by the colonists in those first few months while they were building the fort. And was it very long before they began to adapt to Indian ways? Not very long at all. Um, as an Englishman, I'd spend a couple months in here and during that time pretty much lived side by side with the Yukomikos that were still around, um, learning from them. Mostly what, what as kind far of things? as what to grow, how to grow it, uh, mm -hmm. especially how to get food here. Uh, the colonists, being from London, city folks, really didn't have an idea of how to survive. Despite help from the Yukomiko tribe, many of the colonists died from malaria and dysentery during the first few years, and they were buried here, in the chapel graveyard. So this is the chapel? Well, yes, this is a chapel, but this is a later chapel. There was a chapel built here in the 1630s, and actually we're standing on it about right now. And this would have been the chapel when the settlers first arrived? Yeah, a wooden one. And it burned down in the 1640s. And then later they built this big one in this location. But they buried here. around this chapel. Yeah, we've, we've excavated in this area and there's a lot of graves. And this right. The geophysics task here is to try and find out where the graves stop so that we can work out just how big this burial area was. The graves already discovered around the chapel are incredibly well preserved and by examining them we can get information which just isn't available from the documents of the time. But what's really interesting, uh, Tricia here just discovered this morning I think, is that the coffin, you can see the nails oh, yes. in place? Well what they do is they come up to the side but then we don't have a normal coffin. This one turns at the shoulders, the oh, humerus yeah. so the comes in. in and then there is a little extension for the skull, or the head. It's a, a human form or anthropomorphic coffin. This is really rare in That'd the That would be a, a rather difficult and expensive thing to make, wouldn't it? In, in I would think, carpentry-wise, it would be much because harder. Because you've got to presumably curve it. Mm. So but why then, would people do that in, a, in an early settlement where presumably resources were pretty scarce? A very good question. Uh, one possibility is maybe this was a traditional form of coffin they used, or that maybe from, is there an area of England where this is preferred perhaps or something? We don't, we don't actually dig much of this sort of date. That period? Of the, the, yeah, because um, I mean most of our cemeteries that were in use in the 17th century say around churches, are either still in use mm -hmm. or they are gone out of use but they are still consecrated so you know nobody's allowed to dig in them. Right. So, so could this actually be a mid to late 17th century skeleton? Well a good one of the ways we can tell that I think is look at the shape of the grave shaft itself. 
and how it's oriented. This angle is closer to what the early burials from the 1630s and 40s and 50s were like. And I believe, uh, Patricia, was there much in the way of brick rubble or anything in this grave shaft? There was no brick at all. No brick at, no brick at all. So it's almost pre-brick building. Yes, so it, yeah. it conclusively yeah. has to be earlier than 1666 or 67 then. So it's highly likely that this is actually an English person who came out here and I think and died. very likely, very likely indeed. You like that sort of I thing? Do, don't I you? do, I yeah. yeah. do. That's you, why I like skeletons. You've right? been waiting to ask that, haven't you? I can tell. <laughs> At St Peter's, although we're digging small trenches, progress is slow. It doesn't help that the ground's rock hard, but it's sieving all the soil that takes time. Nevertheless, we are getting 17th century finds to show the St. Peter's landowner, Spence Howard. I was going to ask if you can tell what part of, uh, of what type of uh, vessel it might have been. This is right down at the base. I see. And it's got this coordinate around the side. Uh -huh. Very characteristic for this type of pottery. Is that, is that Staffordshire? Very likely, actually. This is probably a form of like a mug or a tankard. All sorts of fancy European pottery would have come into St Mary's once the colonists' tobacco growing industry started to take off. Our bit of pot is English and comes from a tankard like this. It would have arrived in the colony after 1690 and could have been around in the last years of occupation before the mansion was destroyed in 1694. Stuart's brief today as an archaeological surveyor is to take a look at the two possible sites for the fort but at the moment, he's anxious to talk about something he's discovered here. What have you got for us? And be quick, because there quick. are ticks around. Oh, right. <laughs> I've got my socks tucked in, all right. Um, I've been looking at the, the two possible forts that we've, we've been pointed towards. The, the one by the Key Creek down there. Right. Looked at the site over by Mill Creek over here. Mm -hmm. As I've been going around and looking at them, I've been looking at the topography and also looking at the air photographs, this false colour infrared air photograph. What's starting to, to emerge is a possible other fort over here in this field that we're standing in. Okay. And I'm beginning hey. to wonder if this might be the settlement, the early 1634 settlement when they landed and then closed themselves in this thing which is 120 yards square. <laughs> this alignment here looks to have one of these corner bastions on that we know are, are, are typical of the forts of this period. And it's about the right measurement it's, hmm. it's not that clear on this photograph, but it's enough to make me quite excited Wonder. that this might be the site of the, of the settlement here, the first fort. Do you think that's well, a real possibility, Henry? We need to be careful, I think. Uh, this field was used in, especially 1934, for the big uh, celebration of Maryland's 300th anniversary, and mm -hmm. there was bandstands and all kinds of stuff built out here. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be cautious about the uh, subsequent things. Yeah. The other thing is that we have one reference. In 1639, the militia was ordered to muster, and they were mm -hmm. ordered to come to Ye Chapel Yard next to the fort. Mm. So if the fort is, or the chapel is out over there, mm -hmm. this seems a long way, but maybe that yeah. reference is not say accurate or something. Language at that time, they're, they're often a bit liberal with the use mm -hmm. of the word near or next, aren't they? So maybe that's not as important as Could as be. It might what be. is near in the 70s century? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if we've now got three possible sites for the fort, I, get, I suppose the, what we need yeah. to do, I think, is... As you say, this isn't very clear. Let's get this enhanced, mm. see if we can maybe see if there is a court, another corner to it which should give us a better idea of the dimensions, then come back to it. Mm. Yeah. That is such typical time team. We start out with two sites for a fort, and what we're trying to do is reduce them to one site, and end of day one, and we end up with three sites. By enhancing this aerial photo, we may get a clearer picture of what's showing up as crop marks in this field. So what do you reckon, Stuart? Are you still confident? I like it. I think it, it gets better the more it's enhanced. It, it shows it's got regular sides. It's a trapezoid shape and, and it, it's looking good to me, yeah. Right. Well, it's certainly worth investigating, mm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. End of day one. Uh, we've started digging the trenches at the Mansion House site and the geophys results from the cemetery should be through in the morning, shouldn't they? Mm -hmm. And now we've got this mystery. Is it a fort or is it a 1930s bandstand, Stuart? No, 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 no. <laughs> we'll, <let, laughs> we'll find out after the break.
It's a bit foggy this morning, a bit of a mist, a bit of rain in the air. We're waiting for the geophys results. Actually, I'm feeling incredibly frustrated because the American archaeologists work much, much slower than our archaeologists do. Every last piece of mud they force through the grids in the sieve. And I quite understand why they do that. They have got much less history than we have, so every tiny little artefact really means something to them. And there's half of me that says, fair enough, we're in your country, we've got to respect what you're doing and the way that you do it. But the other half of me is screaming with frustration and thinking, if you don't get a move on soon, then we're not going to be able to prove whether any of the geophysics results mean anything at all. So there is uh, something of an undercurrent between uh, us and our American colleagues. At St Peter's, Phil's doing his best to speed things along. And now that we've extended the trenches here, it should allow us a better look at the archaeology, once we find it. You haven't seen the new evidence that, that's emerged overnight, have you? Well, In terms of, we, we saw the photo. No. Yeah. Stuart, meanwhile, has been busy going through other aerial photos of the site and thinks he's found more evidence for the fort. And can you see this side here? We're starting to get round corner towers yeah. standing out yeah, here. I can see something there. Yeah. Yeah. And on this one we had a round corner tower on this one. So we've got now a regular sided trapezoid. So that looks very convincing as a fort. By combining the two air photos, it's easier to see the four sides of the structure described by Stuart. And although this illustration of the fort at Jamestown in Virginia has three sides, it does give some idea of what a frontier fort would look like. We know from Father Andrew White's narrative that it was at least four-sided mm -hmm. and okay. did have some bastions. He right. unfortunately didn't describe the shape, right. but a, a round bastion like that would certainly be appropriate. Would they really be as large as that in the early yes, years, Yes, I, I agree. I think the, the bastions okay. would certainly be round, but I'm not sure in the amount of time they had they would oh, end okay. that uh, monumental. But if they wanted to mount cannon in them, they would need some you type of fairly substantial... Do, don't you, for recoil uh, and the height like as yeah. something else. Right. Yeah. And also to give them the, the radius of fire that you need to protect. That's why they call it flanks, isn't it? To protect your flanks, they've got to project outside the line of the, the fort. We now have some geophysics results from the chapel graveyard, which shows some faint lines, but nothing that clearly looks like the boundary of a cemetery. The plan is to extend the survey here, but will that leave us with enough time to excavate and confirm anything they find? Let's say these chaps, you know, work hard till lunchtime and they produce uh -huh. some line out here. Uh -huh. We've only then got just over a day to do it. As Tony says, you work much slower than we do. Right. Mm. I mean, if this was England, we would whack a trench in there, probably with a machine, actually, yeah, just, yeah. To, just to see if there's anything there, <laughs> okay. on the basis that there's a lot more of it that you can yeah. do more detailed work on. What, what, okay, we know, this, let's go, the reason we don't usually dig, uh, this, strip off this material, because yeah. about 80% of our artifacts are in that plow soil. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we know from our previous work here, that most of the area around this chapel doesn't have a lot of artifacts in it because people weren't living here. So we could. So what I would say, let's dig a something. trench and shovel it and just put it to the well, side we, that, that, for now. We could work pretty quickly. Dispense quick on, with oh. screening here. We wind fill up. Exactly. <laughs> wind fill up. We'll get him <laughs> set him <laughs> going. I don't think it'll take much winding up. No, no, no. <laughs> but for now, until we have a target to dig at the cemetery, Phil will press on here at St Peter's, where we're beginning to make better progress. <laughs> Okay, one thing about that torch. Huh. Oh, very nice. A little mortar. Hey! Better have. Uh... Tim! We'll have a come and look at this! Ha <laughs> ha! Looks like we got the wall. Oh, hey, look at that. Look, you got this really nice edge. Uh huh. Cutting away down there with all this brick rubble in and what have you. Mm -hmm. And then wallop. Ooh, look at that. And would you look at that edge too? Look at that straight as a die, uh -huh. and look where it's look where it's running to. Yeah. Both sides, bang on line where the geophysics said it was going to be. Uh huh. You pleased? Oh, very much so. It's good to finally see something solid here. So thanks to geophysics, we found the remains of one of the walls of the governor's mansion. But the challenge here at the chapel site, to locate perhaps just a wooden fence around the cemetery, is much more difficult. This burial site is incredibly important because it offers the chance to learn about population levels and all kinds of amazing information about the people who lived here. 
These people here, many of them are living to be 50 and 60 years. That surprises me. Good age. Some of them, like this individual, he's not that old. He's about 33, 34 years, maybe, maybe slightly older mm -hmm. once we get him clean. One of the things that you see is he's got fairly heavy wear. We can, we can yeah. see the angle. Yeah. And as we look at this, this is the, uh, you've got your second and third molars. Those have abscessed out and that's resorbed. Yeah. Now, when you look at the lower jaw, the canine has a wear facet on its back side on, oh, this, yes. on this surface yes. right here. So you've got a gap. And together, if you kind of use your imagination, you can see how they form a little bit of a concavity right here. Oh, right, yes. And that's, ah, a, that's yeah. your pipe facet. So he spent most of his life with a pipe in his mouth, yeah. somewhere or other, smoking the, the tobacco that was growing around here. Lots of individuals had pipe facets, and their pipe facets often so big that it'd be as big around as your cool. little finger. You could stick your little finger in, a, yeah. in that socket. Oh, it's only. It's it hot. It's a humidity, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah, it must have been incredibly difficult to work day after day in this kind of temperature when you were, you know, if you'd just come over here as a colonist. God, I reckon that would have been. So, yeah, here's the wall at Tony. Hmm? St. Peter's house. We now know where the wall is. We know that we can trust the geophysics. They look good. Yeah. We've got our first edge. The bit that we're standing in now, we're going to take that out to try and get the other side of the wall. It's looking good. And most importantly, have you managed to negotiate a speed of working between you and the American archaeologists that you both feel happy about? He's smiling! Yeah. <laughs> is, is he going too fast for you? No, he isn't. Is, it, is he going too slow for you? No, no, I mean, he's happy down there. I mean, like, I'm just going to crack on out with this. I mean, yeah. I, 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 will, I will adopt, dare I say, English tactics on where we're standing. Well, if we can keep digging in this heat, it should be just a question of time before we find the second wall of the governor's mansion in this trench. And although sieving all the soil here takes a lot of time, it does mean that nothing is missed, even tiny objects like this musket ball. We always knew that finding the fort was a long shot this weekend because it was only made of wood and only stood for a few years, but nevertheless, Stuart is convinced he's found it. You're like a sort of field ferret. I'm, feel, I'm feeling quite <laughs> chuffed at the moment. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, I think it's what, what, what do we do? This is the fort, is it? Yeah, I think we This is the location of Stuart's fort, and it does seem to fit well with the documentary evidence, which tells us that the fort was built within half a mile from where they landed here at Church Point. But what are Stuart's reasons for dismissing the other two sites for the fort? If you look at Fort 1, which is down by Key Swamp down there, it was mentioned in some documents as being entrenchments. Yeah. And when you look at the entrenchments, uh, yes, there are some earthworks there, but they're not those of a fort. I think they're representative of a, of a pale, a fence, which was put across this end of the promontory to cut it off. So, yeah. like, like almost to defend the town area. So I think we can dismiss that one. So what about the second one? The second one, it doesn't work there. Where all the fines were fat now. That's yeah, right, yeah. yeah. That doesn't work because the theory of a harbour being down there even to get a shallow draft boat down there, like the Dove, it's got to sail down a steep side of valley. It wouldn't sail. Of course, the best evidence for Stuart's fort is the curious symmetrical shape showing on two different aerial photos. This strange shape, this trapezoid, it's, it's quite important in how the fort works strategically because the, the coastal side, the river side, is there and by putting a narrow side against the sea it prevents us, it's a smaller target for any ships oh, firing yeah, into you. Putting the longer side over here helps protect the settlement side from any um, attack by land here. Right. So the shape is actually quite deliberate, it's not accidental. The fort would have had these big high corner bastions yeah. to mount the cannon on which would have been sort of way up there. Yeah. Cannon on top, you can protect the entrance to the harbour. And that's the sea just by where that little hedge is? That's right, yep. <laughs> and any ships coming up there, if they were trying to attack the fort, because you're on this high, this is one of the highest points here, the tra trajectory of the cannons on the ships, it's difficult to get them to fire up this high as well. Yeah. So you're protecting all your interests by carefully choosing the site. I don't think I've ever seen you as excited <laughs> about <laughs> finding anything as you are now. Why is yes. that? It's that sense of heritage, yes. that sense of finding things which still 
after 20-odd yeah. years doing it, it still gives me a thrill. Yeah. Makes the, the that's, hair why, stand that's why we're in, isn't we, Stuart? Yeah. It's a discovery process. Yes. It really yeah. makes me feel excited because this is the foundation of Maryland here. Yeah. It's fought the very yes. first settlement of Maryland. Well, in a way, Stuart doesn't need to convince us. It's Henry he needs to convince. And he's now dug up an aerial picture of his own, which shows Stuart's fort area as it was during the celebrations here in 1934. Wow, that, that is great. Look at all the detail you can pick up in here. Right here we've got clearly some uh, the seating, the bleachers there. Mm -hmm. There's the tree line we've been talking about earlier. You can see a, a grandstand or something mm -hmm. here, another set of uh, bleachers on the far mm -hmm. side. I think that kind of imitates mm -hmm. your trapezoidal shape. So you're suggesting that the evidence from the photograph there for, the, for those works are what we might be seeing on the photograph. Do I get you right? I, I'm cautious because uh, I think there's probably a lot of land yeah, use right. that's occurred in that area since yeah. the 1630s. There's a bit of a fundamental flaw with that, though. Oh. Uh, yeah, the features that you're showing here are actually heading in the wrong direction. This one is heading towards the end of this avenue, and our fort side is actually heading in that direction. So I think that's really quite fundamental to, you know, to this uh -huh. discussion. By reducing all the photos to the same scale and plotting the information on a map, we should be able to prove or disprove Stuart's argument. And then we need the edge of the sea to come down to where the edge of the sea really is. That, that, that's brilliant. The Clearly, the map, structures put up during the celebrations are on a different alignment to the marks showing on Stuart's air photos, which means that Stuart could be right. We could be looking at evidence for the location of the first fort built by the colonists. It feels a long time since we were here, and it's only yesterday. Yeah. While out at St Peter's, we now have two walls of the governor's mansion. Oh, yeah. Is that the, well, that's the good, isn't it? Is that exactly what geophysics said it would be? It, it, precisely, it, it couldn't be much better than this. God. And very well preserved. Yeah. And this bit here is, is laid in Flemish bond. All right. Which is, yeah. is a, a bit more ornamental, suggesting that this is the much more formal right. side of the building. And I can think of buildings in England that are upstanding with that pattern mm -hmm. of brickwork on the mm -hmm. front. Somewhere like Urchfont Manor in Wiltshire is like that. Flemish bond means that the bricks on the front of this building were laid like this, alternating between bricks head-on and side-on to create a more decorative effect, while the brickwork on the rear of the building laid in English bond like this was less ornate. A subtle difference, but it's one that we would have expected Henry Foreman to comment on. He was an architectural historian, and if he'd seen that, he'd have reported it. And he didn't oh, report it, mm. which suggests he didn't see it. So. That tells us something about how much work he did on the site, which is something we didn't know before. So the wall over there, that might be the first time anyone's seen it since S the center since, times. Yeah, uh -huh. since it blew up. <laughs> <laughs> As a reward for his hard work, Phil's going to be given a chance to end the day by napping a bit of flint to try out in a flintlock musket. English flint was brought across in the ships as ballast and is often found by archaeologists in the doorways of buildings here at St Mary's City. Phil's waste flint today will be left as an extra detail to this building. Can you try that in the gun then? See if it sure. fits okay. Yeah. Would you like to try it? <laughs> yeah. You bet. Yeah, I made it. <laughs> You've done this before, yeah. Phil? I have made flints for flintlocks before, but I've never had the privilege of actually shooting oh, right. one of my... I mean, it's a real first. I mean, yeah, well, it is, but what happens if it doesn't work? <laughs> you have to go and see to make yeah, another one. There, go, there goes my dreams of being a commercial flint now. <laughs> Basically, what happens, you put the powder and the ball down the barrel, and then in here, you put some priming, a very fine powder, and then shut this. This would have been closed. Your priming powder is sitting here in the pan, and when you're, when you're ready to see your target, you come all the way back to full cock, bring this, it all the way back. So that's, is that where you get the say, phrase half cock? Yes, it is. <laughs> flash, yeah. flash in the pan also. I've, I've heard that one, but I've never heard about half cock. <laughs> when you pull the trigger, this flies forward. The flint strikes the face of the battery, shaving off some of the metal, because the flint's harder, and at the same time, knocking it open. Those sparks fall into the pan. They ignite the gunpowder there. It burns through the touch hole, sets off the main charge, and the musket ball's on its way. Right, well then, let's load her up. We pour the entire contents down the barrel. That's the gunpowder, is it? Yes, it is. And you ram, you ram your charge down home, keeping your hands clear. Return it. And then bring it up. <laughs> Safety catch. Right. And you're basically ready to go. 
Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is there a kick on this thing? Uh, you might feel a little bit. Fire from the uh, right shoulder. Take your finger off the trigger real light. There you right. go. And what I'm doing is I'm pushing the cock back to full cock. You hear the click? Yep. It's ready to go. God, I wish I could see what was actually happening. <laughs> cool, what a cracker, eh? That's rather fun. <laughs> what a mean yeah, little kick anyway. on her. Yeah, she's a beast. God, it's a lot of Did fun. Did it have though. a kick on your shoulder? Well, well yeah, well, but not. I mean, like it wouldn't. Why don't we give you a chance? Yeah, to come on. Yeah. <laughs> As a comparison, Carenza is going to fire a matchlock musket, which has an earlier and much simpler firing mechanism. Both weapons were used here on the frontier in the 17th century. <laughs> Wonderfully done. Wonderfully done. Very good, very good. So, end of day two, had a chance to try some sweet potatoes and corn cakes while working out a plan for tomorrow. Will we be able to prove Stuart's new theories about the fort? Fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Bringing a ship up the river under sail like this, with just a little touch on the tiller. Look. Day three, and before starting work on the archaeology, we couldn't resist the offer of a trip on the Dove, a replica of one of the ships involved in establishing the first settlement here. Now, these settlers came in two boats, right? Sure. The Ark and the Dove, and the Ark was the one that the passengers came on, and this is the Dove that they brought their luggage in. <laughs> Effectively, yes. Yes, the Ark carried something like 140 colonists who were going to settle here, the gentlemen adventurers and their servants, whereas the Dove was used, uh, as you say, to carry the cargo, uh, and also, after they'd landed, uh, was used for nipping up and down the river to trade with the Indians, to negotiate with them. And this settlement that they established, that wasn't the first settlement that the English had created. Oh, it? crumbs no. I mean, they'd been trying for ages. Newfoundland in the 1580s and Roanoke Island. Uh, Sir Walter Raleigh tried and failed. Uh, and in New England, of course, Pilgrim Fathers, 1620. Uh, we're 1634, little way down the line, but still this was a, an untouched area, uh, a virgin shore, if you liked, and which it, they could exploit. And it was essentially a business enterprise. Well, it's a mixture. I, the Calverts, the Lords Baltimore, yes, they wanted to make money, but they also wanted, I think, to, to bring their vision of a manorial England, and particularly a Roman Catholic enclave, to this particular neck of the woods. Well... Pleasure trip over, and it's time for work. At the chapel site, the news from the geophysics team is that the natural geology is causing too many problems for them to define the boundaries of the cemetery. It's putting in a lot of effort, and we're, we're still finding it difficult to interpret what's going on. Right. We're not coming up with instant answers. So it's just too complex, really, is the problem? It, it is. Uh, I think we might be better going elsewhere well, today. Well, we've got other ideas, haven't we, Henry? Where we I think we've got lots of other... <laughs> rest yeah. of the day. We've got lots of possibilities, yeah, so why don't we... But not too about... many, though, because right. it's going to be hot. <laughs> so geophysics are stopping work here. Never mind. With a lost city like St Mary's, there's no shortage of other targets to go for. But really, we couldn't leave America without doing some work to test the new ideas about the location of the fort. If Stuart's right, then it presents a few problems for the archaeologists here because the reconstructed building containing our incident room and the visitor's car park have been built across one corner of it. I think this side of the fort comes actually just by the incident room there, comes through the orchard and there's a bastion just, just here at this end of the car park, one of these corner bastions, and this site comes through the and under the car park. That's the working hypothesis at the moment. So it's just a rough... At, at this stage. That's great. I can, from that, I can clean this up. Okay. But I think I'll get you back to uh, check later. Right. Our problem is that the margin of error in drawing lines like this on the computer screen could be as much as 30 or 40 feet. Far too big to have a good chance of hitting one of the walls of the fort with the small American-sized trench. We need to hope that the geophysics can help us target an area to dig. 
At St Peter's, the plan for today is to clean up and record what we've found here. This information will now be used to check Foreman's plan of the building and will help us put together the most accurate picture to date of how the Governor's Mansion looked in the late 17th century. We know the ground plan now. Yeah, We've got good data yeah. on that. We know it was yeah. two stories. But I think that the roof, the, the uh, roof is just a little too steep here. Right. I think it ought to be shortened some. Okay. I can actually pull that down. So if you just say when. Oh, that's, that's yeah. nice. That's, yes, I think it looks better, doesn't it? We're thinking that this is sort of uh, continental Italian influences yeah. or something right. like that, perhaps, right. for this building. While the grass is cut at Stewart's Fort, geophysics have been surveying Fort Site 1, where the lumps and bumps in this field have traditionally been associated with the fort. Stewart's interpretation is that this ridge of high ground is more likely to be a pale, which is a boundary wall designed to separate the settlement from the wilderness beyond. I was mainly interested in what's forming this, this ridge. Here behind oh, well, us, we've got nothing. Nothing at all. We, at first, we thought one of the linears might be on top of the bank, and so we thought it might be your pale. Yeah. But it turns out that it, it's just these plough ridges. We're right. not detecting yeah. anything else. Well, that, I mean, that, we've had this before, haven't we? Where the, there is a risen earthwork, which that bank is there, and that doesn't show on the geophysics very well because it's just spread earth. Yeah, but you were asking for us to look for a ditch associated with that. Well, I thought bank. there might be a ditch associated yeah. with it, but I, you can't um, ignore the risen banks. As well. Is there any way that... I think we can say there's no ditch associated with that. Right, though. right. I'd like to know if this, was actually, if this is a genuine bank feature, but if you're feeling that it's not worth putting a section through it... I think where, it's where, the hell, a... where the hell are we going to put this section? Well, I, I put it across this level area. We ain't going to get all that done today. We ain't going to get all that done today, Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that's a bigger hole than we've achieved in the last two days. Yeah. And it's well, a damn sight otter today. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> I mean... Well, we are going to dig to try and prove if the bank here is man-made. What we really need is a big trench across a wide area to allow us to see the subtle changes where one layer of soil has been piled out of sequence on top of another. This long, thin trench is a compromise, but it should at least give us some finds to tell us more about activity here in the 17th century. God, this is hot. With temperatures reaching 100 degrees today, Carenza's more than happy in our air-conditioned incident room, where she's discovered more archaeology showing on some air photos relating to St Peter's. That's um, St Peter's there. You can see the house shows up really nicely. It almost looks as if it's got a little uh, portico or something outside the front. But what's yeah. really exciting is um, these dark lines here, which um, we sketch plotted out, and look as if they might be the remains of a garden or something. That would be quite a discovery. This is so early, we're talking about 1670s, to have a garden or a formal arrangement like that would be really unusual. Well, I'll show you what we've done. Might, might this expect is, it, though, from a house of that Well, it'd be nice, though, if it's, if it's, an early, if it's right. one of the first. That's, that's really nice. You can see what we've done. This is that, that same okay. photograph grabbed in and okay. overlain. And now you can see that's the same field there. That's yes. the house. Yes, right there. Um, mm. And that's the sort of main features of the gardens as, as we can see them from that photograph. Yeah, you can go ahead and start pulling on the spray. Hello, Phil to Stewart, over. Yes. Hello, Phil, still here. Well, we've done it, Stewart. We've got your hole for you. We've got the complete section, yeah. and I wish to report yeah, it's right. nothing but plough soil overlying subsoil. How would you react to that? Over. Um, it sounds good. I mean, at least it sounds if we're knocking on the head the traditional soil down there, doesn't it, Phil? Right, well, that's it there. Well, really, this trench is too small and narrow to prove either the pale or the fort theories, although we would expect some finds here if this was the site of the fort. Over at Stewart's site, the geophysics have finished their survey of this area but haven't found anything to help us locate the fort. It now looks like Stewart's theories are going to have to be left for the Americans to sort out, because with no geophysics guidance, we'd have to dig a massive trench to stand a chance of finding anything. Well... Have that back for delivery service then. Eh? <laughs> yeah. However, the geophysics search here has revealed something else, which with little time left, we have to start digging straight away. So why here then? Why here? Basically, we've got some very strong anomalies. 
on the magnetometer. Oh, crikey, yeah. Is that, is that orientated that way around? That's orientated that way around. Like that, yeah. The fence behind me. Yeah. Here. Yeah. And you can see there's one or two peaks, but here there's a very strong concentration. Enormous, noisy, really area in the corner, strong yeah. Yeah. And responses. Because it could, you, it could be almost anything, couldn't it? I tell you something yeah. there is here, which What's, we didn't get in the other trenches. What's that? Bits of brick. Ah, well, I mean, the interpretation is it's going to be lots of fired bricks, it's going to be lumps of metal, or it yeah. could be nails. Debris. It could be very recent. Well, these are, this this isn't what we had over the uh, the old traditional fort. Right. Well, bits of brick aren't the only immediate find in this trench. This modern tent peg would have had an effect on the geophysics signals. Oh I mean, this is why I targeted this one particular that point. One, okay. That's right where this now, is that one of yours, yeah. Henry? Let's see what the size of that is. That won't be all like your seven, signal there, something. will it? John. That will be yeah, responsible for good. Yeah. the strong response we've got in this area, but no, not. there's obviously going to be, a, I should think, a concentration of debris yeah. in this yeah. area. We've yeah. just selected one point. Well, we've got to carry on down. Good. Right. Yes, well, we'll take those out the way. Well, I'm glad it's not me who's having to dig in this heat. At the Chapel Cemetery, this excavation is nearly finished. And once these bones have been examined, this skeleton will be given a proper reburial. But for one visitor today, all this is more than just interesting because it's quite likely that one of her ancestors is buried here. I understand you're a, a descendant of one of the original passengers on the Ark. That's correct. Which yes, one's? Uh, Thomas Green. Oh, one of the more important, important ones. ones. Well, oh, yes. We're... What do you know about him? Well, only a little bit of what I have read, you know, that he was the second provincial governor and um, Leonard Calvert um, made him the governor on his, well, he was on his deathbed. On the way over on the Ark, uh, he evidently fell in love with uh, mm -hmm. Mistress Anne Cox, who was the, the only other gentlewoman on the, on the, on the boat. <laughs> and they were, they were married, apparently on the beach, by Father Andrew White, uh, you know, the first marriage in, in colonial Maryland. And of course their son, Thomas, was the first English birth in Maryland. Although I, th I think Joyce, you're descended from his brother Leonard. That's correct. Number yes. two. Two, number two. Yes. Right. Yeah. So there was a single woman who came over on the first boat. That's right. Why did she come on her own? I have no idea. <laughs> the well, mind boggles, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. Do you think that you would have had the courage to set sail on your own and land in America and uh, marry your boyfriend on the beach? <laughs> oh, I might have. It's hard to say. I'm a little adventurous. So, Are you? Uh, yes. It <laughs> yeah. runs in the blood. Well, <laughs> what you got, Phil? Well, bricks. And they're they're in situ. Oh right! Look at that, and and look, look there's, there's mortar oh, in there. Oh, oh excellent! Wow. So excellent. brick structure. Is that? Is well, let's that? clear off this whole area then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are we okay, John. That would give you the signal. Yeah, that that would definitely do it. There's no doubt about that. Is this a building that you suspect, Henry? Anyway, or yeah, I suspected because we had on in the field walk here, we had lots of nails and right. pottery and tobacco pipe fragments and things of that nature. So the sort of debris that would suggest a building underneath, in fact, right. Right. and a brick concentration right. somewhere in this vicinity, but we couldn't pinpoint it. I, that, I can't believe you're coming right down on the brick foundation. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I'm a convert well, I... <laughs> to, to the geophysics team. Talk to Phil, say it a bit lower. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Phil, Phil sometimes takes a bit of convincing about it. Oh, you see. what? Me? Never doubted <laughs> him for one minute. Well, Phil doesn't need to be convinced about this. We've definitely found the remains of a building here. But can we work out a date for it from the finds? That's a yes. round bottle glass, which is generally just for the colonial era in this yeah. part of the world. So that's not really very datable, I think. Like not, that. No. unfortunately. No. This is a piece of black glazed uh, earthenware. It could be anywhere from 1690 to up to the 1770s. That's very familiar to us, of course. Is it? This is presumably come from Bristol or Birmingham or somewhere, or Staffordshire or somewhere like that. Right. Yeah. Right. And this and is this a tobacco pipe. pipe, and actually it's got a good sized borehole in it, which right. indicates that it's probably of uh, 17th century date. Right. So this may right. be from the late 1600s when I think there was a building in this area. When geophysics works, it really does work well. And Henry's clearly delighted that we've managed to find another brick structure in a city which was mostly made of wood. But no need to check the clock. We can tell from Phil's body language that we've reached the end of a very hot day. 
feel? How about doing another five feet to get the other side? Well, you've only got one half. <laughs> it's the way you tell them, John. <laughs> so this is the big result of today's work. What is it? Well, my guess is that it's a chimney base or some type of a brick foundation from a building that was built here in the late 1600s, I would think, based on the artifacts we found in the trench. Brick, the glass, the plaster, suggesting this was a building of some, uh, some size yeah, yeah. and probably... Slightly high size. status. Somewhat, mm -hmm. Is it a fort? Uh, <laughs> unless it's a brick one, I don't think so. <laughs> we don't have many of those around here, but maybe Stuart can answer a little of that. Yeah, I think this is outside the fort anyway. The predicted line is, is about 10, 15 metres that way. And I think it's probably formed by a rampart of earth with a palisade above it. And it's been ploughed away and left no trace. Geophysics were looking for a ditch in effect which was above the ground. But like, you know, the first settlers here, I'll defend my fort to the last. <laughs> <laughs> if Stuart's right, and he has found the location of the first fort built by the colonists, then it would look like this. And was positioned approximately here. I must admit, Stuart does seem incredibly confident about it, but for the moment, it has to remain a theory, and it's only future work here by American archaeologists that will prove it one way or the other. But today was really all about the discovery of this building, which was part of the settlement here some 60 or 70 years after the fort. This was a relatively high status building with a brick chimney and plaster on its walls. And it occupied the end plot of a row of three houses, which looked something like this towards the end of the 17th century. But perhaps the most important achievement this weekend was locating the remains of this building, the Governor's Mansion, the first building of its kind in America. And this reconstruction is really only the beginning, because future work here should reveal more detailed information about the additional walls and formal gardens predicted by geophysics and the air photo evidence this weekend. How about the future, Henry? Are you going to be able to extend this trench or what? Well, I would hope that we'll be able to get back to this. Uh, this is another building that we might want to work on, maybe even do a reconstruction on at some point. But at least this tells us where it is, so we've added one more structure to our knowledge of this lost city. All part of the great jigsaw. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You've also got a hell of a lot of sieving to do. <laughs> <laughs> Comes with the territory. <laughs> yeah.